Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining this um, community session of interest uh, sponsored by Alberta Motor Transport Association. For some of you, it is very early in the morning, and for others, it is uh, past uh, supper time. So your interest in the, this session is even more motivating for the moving on organizers and uh, sponsors. I'm also hoping that all of you and your families are safe and healthy during uh, these uh, challenging times. If we can move on to the next uh, slide, please. So my name is Robert Rolescu, and I'm an expert in uh, truck and bus uh, tire design at Michelin. I will facilitate uh, this uh, session that will introduce the challenges of uh, widespread uh, deployment of uh, fuel cell trucks, but also call on experts for a working session that will be carried out in uh, September or later this year uh, to identify solutions that address the challenges introduced uh, today. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So to make this happen, I will uh, be joined today by Marcel Poliot, who is the Vice President of uh, Industry and Regulatory Affairs at uh, Trimac uh, Transportation, as well as by Jessica Lov, who is the Research Lead for the Canadian Energy Systems Analysis and Research at the University of Calgary. Note that this uh, session in, um, uh, is in the continuity of what has been discussed in uh, previous summits at uh, Moving On, uh, spe uh, specifically the one in uh, 2019, where experts uh, have identified solutions that could increase the range of uh, both battery and fuel cell powered uh, Class 8 uh, trucks. So some of you, in fact, might have participated as experts at these uh, past editions. So before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping items. So all along the sessions, you can use the Q&A panel for your, uh, on your computer screen to send your questions and comments. And for those watching us on their phones, you can just click the question mark button at the top right corner of your screen. Uh, with Marcella and Jessica, we will try to answer as many questions as possible at uh, the end of the session. And of course, for uh, those questions that we cannot, we, we won't have time, we will make sure that we will provide the answers in time. Uh, also, for those uh, interested in joining uh, the working session in uh, September, uh, you can use the same means to enter your name uh, and contact email, uh, stating that you're interested, of course, uh, in attending, as well as your field of expertise. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with the first topic on the agenda for today. So in the following video, you'll hear from uh, Florent Menego, who is the CEO of the Michelin Group from uh, Julie Sweet, who is the CEO of Accenture, and from uh, Patrick Kohler, the CEO of uh, Foresia. Uh, they will discuss the impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, the power of working ecosystems, and the moving on shared governance. So let's watch. The future of the planet is at stake today. We already were convinced of this, and what we experience together increases the sense of urgency. Therefore, we must go even further to make people and goods mobility safer, more accessible and efficient. We must be the generation that will pass on a more sustainable Earth to future generations. We must move forward and faster towards sustainable mobility. Beyond the economy, the entire wealth creation for nations is at stake. Their ability to innovate, to develop, to invest and maintain a social system that protects us all and gives us the ability to be the future for everyone. The transport sector, which accounts for 28% of global energy-related emissions and employs close to 300 million persons, has a especially important role to play. It's about bringing real economy actors, civil society and governments together to address a sector that if we fail in our effort to make this sector a sustainable sector, we will not achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Innovation and challenges are becoming global. Alone, we are nothing. Nations, regions, cities, companies, big, small or emerging, NGOs and of course, all of us, people living on Earth. We all have the duty and power to invent the world of tomorrow. We all have an essential role to play together with Moving On. I think it is critical that as companies, we harness that power, that agility that we all demonstrated in responding to the crisis, because innovation really cannot be done alone. Today's fast moving environment 
and in particular in times of economic crisis, such collaboration is absolutely fundamental. We should move towards a new resilient economic paradigm, a more balanced one, not only focused on short-term financial performance, which are needed, but not only, with a model which also considers sustainability. Today, we all have to change ourselves and to change everything. Together, we are not only stronger, but also smarter. Collective action is the only way to foster a change and have a real positive impact on people's life. And I do know that together, with your help, we will take moving on ecosystem to the next level. So with uh, this setting in mind, uh, let us now introduce through a short video uh, our sponsor AMTA, as well as the Azetec project that aims to develop and test the hydrogen fuels in Alberta freight uh, transportation sector. So let's watch the next video. Since 1938, the Alberta Motor Transport Association has remained the voice, the standard and the resource for the commercial transportation industry in the province. We are the Transportation Industries Health and Safety Association core certifying partner and member advocacy organization. Representing more than 15,500 employers throughout Alberta, the AMTA boasts members from a range of industries, including municipalities, and through a diverse range of services, we continue to enhance safety and compliance everywhere transportation goes. We foster strategic partnerships, member engagement, and innovative technologies. Improving safety and creating a professional identity for an industry that benefits every Alberta. Trucking moves approximately 90% of all consumer products and foodstuffs in Canada and almost two-thirds by value of Canada's trade with the United States. Our members move every aspect of Alberta's economy and there's no question they are vital to the success of the province. AMTA leads through collaboration and engagement with industry advocacy, leading edge alternative fuel projects, education programs, and by promoting public safety. The $16.5 million Alberta Zero Emissions Truck Electrification Collaboration is just one such example of this approach and will be the catalyst to transforming transportation and creating a new hydrogen economy for Alberta. Transportation is and will always remain an essential service. The AMTA is here to ensure you stay informed and connected to Alberta's commercial transportation industry. Visit us today at amta.ca. So following this uh, inspiring introduction of uh, AMTA, oh, AMTA and the uh, Azetec project, uh, I would like to ask my colleagues, uh, Marcel and Jessica, to provide some perspective on the challenges ahead from uh, both the technology and hydrogen supplies viewpoint, as well as from a business and technology and user standpoint. So, Marcel and Jessica, I'll let you take it from here. So, thank you, Robert. Uh, good morning. It's Marcel. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, in Canada, the trucking sector is an essential part of our economy and the well-being of our society. The population of Canada is nearly 38 million people who have settled across the vast portion of our country. To put this into perspective, the driving distance from the city of St. John's on Canada's Atlantic coast to the city of Vancouver on the Pacific coast, it's over 7,000 kilometers one way, and you actually cross six time zones to get there. So to deal with these long distance challenges, Canada has developed an efficient multimodal supply chain network. Last year, the Canadian supply chain transported 850 million tons of goods within the country for domestic trade. And over 75% of that volume was moved over the road with trucks. From an international trade perspective, trucking moved $430 billion worth of cargo between Canada and the United States last year. And this is nearly 60% of the value of exports and imports between our two countries. Now, the vast majority of trucks, especially the highway tractor trailer fleets, are powered by internal combustion engines fueled by diesel. 
These trucks are very reliable, they're safe, they provide the best total cost of ownership alternatives for the trucking companies and for the supply chain. And from an economic perspective, the trucking industry can be described as a large cash flow and low margin business. Therefore, any cost impacts from new technology or disruption is actually passed on to the final consumer of the goods being transported. From a greenhouse gas emission perspective, the Canadian transportation sector emitted 174 million tons last year, and on-road freight produced 61 million tons, or 9% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Now, trucking has been relying on the internal combustion engines for nearly 50 years. And with the development of electric vehicles and the recent commercializations of certain categories of electric trucks, and the need to decrease, if not eliminate, greenhouse gas emissions for the future, we can clearly state that, a trucking, is, that trucking is poised for innovation at this point. It's also very important for the supply chain to have a cost-efficient energy source to replace diesel fuel. And uh, Jessica will thus discuss this in more details in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea for the Alberta Zero Emission Truck Electrification Collaboration, known as the Azatec project, was actually launched in 2018. We proposed to build two fuel cell electric highway tractors powered by hydrogen to transport commercial freight between the cities of Calgary and Edmonton in the province of Alberta. These tractors need to be designed for the Alberta legal gross weight of 63,500 kilograms or 140,000 pounds. They will be pulling two trailers, either in a B-train configuration or a double trailer configuration as seen on the pictures to the right of the, of the screen. The tractor operating range between refilling of the hydrogen tanks needs to be at least 700 kilometers and they must generate zero tailpipe emissions. Now the hydrogen for this demonstration will be produced in Alberta from natural gas via steam methane reforming. So note that carbon management will not be available for this phase of the ASTEC project. However, carbon management is definitely included for the future phases. So these prototypes are currently being worked on by the ASTEC partners. We expect to put the tractors into service in August of 2021 and operate them between Calgary and Edmonton until the end of 2022. Next slide, please. The project cost to design, build, and operate these two tractors is approximately $17 million. The Alberta government will provide funding of $7.5 million through the Emissions Reduction Alberta Program, referred to as DRA. And this, the project is also supported by the Transition Accelerator. The Alberta Motor Transport Association is the lead applicant for the ERA funding and is overseeing the project management with the assistance of the Zen Clean Energy Solution. From a vehicle perspective, Freightliner, a division of Daimler Truck North America, provided the Cascadia model tractor chassis, known as a glider kit. These are basically the tractor with the, without the engine or the drivetrain systems. Ballard Power is providing the hydrogen fuel cell units and the design of the hydrogen storage systems for installation on the tractors. And the Dana company is leading the design and will provide the drivetrains and the e-propulsion systems required for 63.5 for tons operating weight. Uh, Dana will also assemble the tractors at their Nordressa vehicle integrator subsidiary, uh, which is located in Montreal. The two carriers who operate these ASTEC tractors are Trimac Transportation and Bison Transport. The fueling system and procurement of the hydrogen is managed by the Hydrogen Technology and Energy Corporation, known as HTEC. And finally, the partners who are managing the research component and the next project phase towards commercialization are the University of Calgary, the Canadian Energy Systems Analysis Research, known as CSER, and the Energy Futures Lab. So as you can see on the slide, this project is truly a collaboration involving a wide range of partners. I invite you to visit the azatech.ca website for additional information. Next slide, please. We set three major objectives for the HTEC project. 
The first objective is the opportunity for the Canadian trucking industry to guide the development of electric drive technology and fuel cell applications to replace the current reliance on internal combustion engines and diesel fuel without impacting the efficiency and cost of the supply chain. That's a tall order. So the trucking industry relies on high utility, fast refueling, predictable energy costs, and maximum payloads to support the efficiency of the supply chain. Uh, several Aztec partners actually move forward the development of higher gross weight vehicle systems by several years as a result of the Aztec ERA funding. The second objective is to have a credible and compelling solution for the trucking sector to engage on a zero emission pathway. A reduction of 61 million tons of greenhouse gas in the country without having to increase the distribution costs is a very compelling story to transition away from diesel fuel. And the final objective is really to kickstart a Canadian hydrogen economy. Uh, ATA, DRA, and all the Aztec partners truly believe that the trucking sector is the needed anchor for the development of hydrogen production and distribution in Canada and to leverage Canada's regional natural resources, such as hydroelectricity and natural gas to power zero emission mobility solutions. Next slide, please. So Jessica, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to you at this point. Thanks a lot, Marcel, Thanks. great presentation. Um, hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jessica Loaf. I am from the CSER Initiative at the University of Calgary and I am a, an associate with the not-for-profit organization, the Transition Accelerator. I am going to be talking about how the adoption of hydrogen fuel cell electric trucks can lead to a transition towards a hydrogen economy. But before I do so, I want to provide some context. Canada, like most other countries around the world, have made substantial uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction commitments as part of the Paris Accord. Canada is aiming to be net zero by 2050. And we want to do so while maintaining our economic prosperity and supporting a growing population. A change of this nature is not going to happen in the margins and it's not going to happen through incremental improvements. We need to look for transformative systems level change. Well, Canada is also a large producer and exporter of oil products. And a significant change in the demand for these products, whether it's driven by climate change or other forces, will have an impact on the economic well being of the nation and the social systems that depends on it. But what if? What, what if Canada were to become a producer, an exporter, and consumer of a low carbon fuel and energy products? Next slide, please. This brings us to the opportunity of the hydrogen economy. Canada is well positioned to leverage our, our natural resources and technical strengths to be a producer of hydrogen, a low carbon energy source and fuel. Now there are many ways to produce hydrogen as shown on this graph on the top portion there. But the most common way to produce hydrogen right now is through fossil fuels using steam methane re reforming or auto thermal reforming. And when paired with carbon capture and storage, this is referred to as blue hydrogen. This method can achieve between an 80 to 90% emissions reduction on a well to wheel basis. Hydrogen can also be produced through renewable electricity using electrolysis technology. And th this method is referred to or commonly referred to as green hydrogen. Either way or whichever way hydrogen is produced, it can be moved through distribution systems to feed a a variety of market end use markets. However, we see that the transportation sector and in particular the heavy duty uh, segment is an ideal anchor in a transition to a hydrogen economy. This is for several reasons. The first is they're a very large consumer of energy, but they also have very predictable, frequent and concentrated demand for energy. And lastly, they pay a lot of money for their energy. They put a lot of value on their energy compared to the other, other sectors. 
this is important as a early adopter. A uh, shift to a hydrogen economy can also benefit other sectors, such as big industries like cement and steel, also building and district heat, and also the chem chemical industry as well, all of which are, have been traditionally very difficult to decarbonize. Next slide, please. So when we look to alternative fuels um, to, to feed into the transportation market, we know that they have to be competitive with diesel on a price basis. Diesel in Canada currently retails pre-tax for about 85 cents per litre. This is equivalent to about 21 to 22 dollars per gigajoule. So for hydrogen to be competitive with diesel, it needs to retail for about 25 to 35 dollars per gigajoule. And this is equal to about three dollars and 50 to five dollars per kilogram. And this takes into account the, the powertrain efficiency gains of a hydrogen fuel cell electric system. In Canada, because we have exceptionally low natural gas prices of between $1 to $2 per gigajoule, we can produce blue hydrogen for about $7 per gigajoule, which is about a dollar or just over a dollar per kilogram. And this includes the cost of carbon capture and sequestration. We can also produce green hydrogen but it is a bit more expensive and it depends on the cost of electricity. If, electri if electricity can be purchased for under $30 per megawatt, megawatt hour, it, it can be competitive with blue hydrogen. But we, but we need to get the hydrogen from where it is produced to where it is consumed. And currently this is, a very, this is an area of very high cost and uncertainty. And this is, this is largely because the distribution and refueling infrastructure is non-existent or there's very little of it. So for these costs to come down, a critical scale in concentrated regions is needed to, reach, to be reached so that hydrogen can be competitive with diesel, which is a very mature system. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So let's talk about greenhouse gas emissions. As Marcel mentioned, that the ACE Tech demonstration project is not yet able to include CCS or carbon capture and sequestration. And this is because it is a very small pilot project, only consuming about 200 kilograms of hydrogen per day. However, what it is doing, it is shifting emissions from where, a place where they cannot be controlled, and that is the, the tailpipe of the diesel system there, is shifting them upstream to a place where they can be managed in the future. So future phases of ASTEC and commercialization um, will certainly include a carbon capture and sequestration element, um, and you'll leverage the already proven and operational uh, carbon capture and sequestration systems that are available already in Alberta through our uh, Shell's, um, sorry, the Shell Quest and, and the uh, carbon trunk line operations already. So moving on to the next slide, please. So when we look to these future phases, um, we are looking to rapidly shift from a demonstration to commercialization. We want to grow from two trucks to 100 trucks to 1,000 trucks or more. But we want to do so strategically so that we're growing our systems that are aligned with the, the buildup of the necessary infrastructure. We figure that demand center centers need to have a, a capacity of, about, of at least one to three tons of hydrogen per day. And they need to be in, in corridors that will have those demands. And we are currently collaborating with key stakeholder groups that can be a part of these, these future hydrogen ecosystems. This is a very exciting time to be in transportation. And you know, it's a great time to be a part of an energy system. Thank you all. This is the end of my presentation. I believe we'll have questions at the end of this seminar. So I guess I'll pass it to you, Robert. Yes. And, and Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, so great, uh, great introduction here and providing the context, expectation and challenges uh, ahead. 
to help us address some of the roadblocks, though, uh, we had to develop some of the some meta methodology with our partner Salsum. So uh, the following video will uh, describe a little bit of the design process that brings together the experts uh, from industry, academia, government, and uh, other nonprofit uh, organizations uh, around the table or around the virtual table in uh, in our case. Uh, so that we can think and work together in uh, identifying these uh, solutions to the problem uh, posed. So let's uh, just watch this uh, next video from Talston. conversations around the complex transitions which we have to make. What do we need to do to make this happen? We need to build an ecosystem to tackle the barriers. So this is the job that's before us today. And therefore I'm very, very happy that we are uh, joining forces, TDA with the EV100, the Climate Group and Telstra Drive, uh, Drive to Zero in partnership with moving on for this kickoff session. And now let's move on. Excellent. So uh, I have to admit that this is where uh, I missed a little bit the face to face meetings uh, since I do not see your your body language to gauge a little bit of your engagement. But I can promise you that uh, what is coming up is more the fun part since we will now describe how the working session will be organized and how we will call on your participation. And just as a reminder, uh, please use your uh, chat boxes to ask your questions uh, and indicate your interest to, to participate in the working session. And do not provide, do not forget to, uh, to provide your email and area of expertise so that we can call on you. So let's start with uh, the burning question so we can go to the next slide, please. Right. So uh, how do we merge a sustainable tracking, a sustainable tracking sector, a sector into a hydrogen uh, economy? That is the burning question that we have uh, to answer. Um, and uh, there are, of course, some parallels versus what uh, some of you might have seen in the earlier uh, session today from uh, the Transporter Capitalization Alliance. But here we want to be a little bit more specific. Uh, we want to go into the Canadian example and probably even more on the Alberta uh, province uh, example to, um, uh, to make it more specific. So as you can imagine, the task is not easy and uh, to make it uh, easier to manage, we have decided to break it up into six focus areas that I would like now to ask oh, Marcel and Jessica to comment. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'll jump in with the first couple of questions. So the first question is, how do we advance the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle technology while meeting the needs of the trucking sector? Well, if you consider the various components needed to build our easy tech tractors, you know, first we start with a tractor, then we add electric drives, power management systems, uh, battery storage, hydrogen fuel cells, hydrogen storage and tires. We need tires designed to resist the different torque loads generated by electric drives versus diesel engines. And the list goes on. So you see we, we need a wide range of expertise is needed to fully discuss this question. So we would be very interested to hear from experts from original equipment manufacturers or OEMs for short, uh, drivetrain and e-propulsion system companies, fuel cell manufacturers, battery and power management companies, uh, tire manufacturers. Uh, in fact, Robert, uh, given your involvement with moving on in previous years, uh, you probably have additional suggestions or ideas to share on this. Absolutely, absolutely. So in fact, uh, those have been some uh, 
sessions that we have carried on at past uh, past uh, sessions at moving on uh, and we had uh, in fact great participations and we know of interest that uh, OEMs and their advanced engineering groups uh, have uh, indicated to these uh, these topics and we also can point out to several alliances that we have heard in the uh, in the recent news uh, where uh, big OEMs are coming together to really address these challenges and we can point for instance to the uh, Daimler to Volvo Alliance on the developing the fuel cell trucks. Uh, we can point to uh, the Kenworth and Toyota Alliance also on the fuel cells and uh, finally on Nikola Motors uh, and Iveco also to, to make it this, uh, this happen. So a lot of activity on this area for freight transportation that is going to be pretty exciting. Great, thank you. Um, the second question is in what ways could a transition to a hydrogen economy add value to a shipper's supply chain, logistics, and business systems. So I believe that this discussion topic would likely be of interest to any businesses that rely on the trucking portion of supply chain and is also concerned about sustainability. So this would include a wide range of manufacturing industries, uh, members of shipping communities, logistics companies, distribution companies, freight carriers, and all of their respective industry association for each one of these sectors. And uh, we would truly benefit from your insight on the potential impact of the supply chain. Uh, Jessica, as part of CSER, you interact with a wide range of organizations that are really interested in, uh, in uh, the hydrogen uh, uh, economy and transportation. Um, is there any other expertise you can think of for this topic? Yes, absolutely. So there are many um, organizations that you know can benefit from a transition to hydrogen, and it will add value to their their business. So, you know, speaking with warehouses, that'd be a, an excellent starting point, and as well uh, um, as, as the other modes, which we're going to be talking about uh, later on here. So I, I guess I'll. Uh, Shift to question three. Um, and we are, we're also going to have a topic that talks about what factors are, are needed to be considered to make a blue hydrogen supply corridor successful and what are the major barriers. So there are many aspects to a hydrogen value chain from hydrogen supply to distribution to refueling stations and the end use. Um, and specifically, we're talking about transportation and uses in this case. Um, and there are a lot of barriers in each of those um, links in the value chain. So what we're wanting to do with this question is, is really hash this out is, is has experts from each of the areas in the value chain to be represented and to have the discussion of what it is going to take um, to, to um, deploy and advance a hydrogen corridor um, that it is based on a blue hydrogen production. So experts, we uh, specifically, we're looking for uh, hydrogen producers, um, carbon capture and storage um, operators and experts there. Um, we are looking for the hydrogen fueling infrastructure, fueling station infrastructure, sorry, uh, experts as well. So there should be some really great discussion that happens on this topic here. And then likewise, for topic four is the same question, but it's for a green hydrogen supply corridor. So green hydrogen will be produced from renewable electricity. So there's a lot of regional uh, considerations here. Is there the supply of, of the renewable electricity? Um, so we're again, we're looking for all aspects of the value chain here to have the same type of discussion. And maybe I can add, uh, Jessica, that uh, there were quite a few uh, experts that um, manifested their interest uh, from from Europe, uh, namely companies like Hydrogen Europe, uh, Foracia, Symbio, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hydrogen Energy, and FCH Europa, uh, all indicated that they are very interested to participate in our working sessions. So that's it's good. It's good to hear. Yeah, that, is, that is excellent yep. to hear. Absolutely, Marcel. I'll let you Thank continue. You. On no. our Perfect. So question five, <clears throat> what trucking related financing policy and regulation changes are required to transition to a hydrogen economy? Now this question casts a very, very wide net. You know, the reliance on diesel fuel provides numerous economic mechanisms today related to road transportation. 
For example, the supply chain relies on a very robust and well-established fuel surcharge mechanism in place across the various markets and countries. Uh, governments rely on fuel tax for infrastructure funding. Uh, the International Fuel Tax Agreement, or IFTA in North America, uh, provides an equitable distribution of fuel tax across all states and provinces. Um, and because if to actually distribute the taxes on the diesel for trucks in the jurisdiction where the fuel was used, not where it was purchased. So, um, <clears throat> and then uh, as the trucking supply chain moves away from diesel, you know, shippers and governments will need to manage a wide range of energy sources and energy costs with significant regional uh, variations. Um, or maybe potentially find a suitable alternative such as a, a per kilometer, kilometer charge. Um, now the investment model for, will also change as fleets will likely face increased working capital and a wider range of variable costs such as energy and maintenance. So it would be very interesting to model the financial impact of the hydrogen economy on the trucking sector. And uh, as well, uh, current SAE standards for electric vehicles are currently being developed. Uh, this will likely impact a wide range of regulations from people like Transport Canada, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and, and so on. So we would like to hear from anyone who's dealing with policy settings, industry trade practice, investment firms, uh, just name a few. Robert, anything else, anybody else you could think of? Uh, I, I think also on the on the financing part, of course, the uh, the, the banks probably are going to be key, uh, and all the investment firms that are behind. So uh, again, in past editions, uh, we had good representations for um, uh, institutions that were representing all the financing uh, behind. So I think uh, having those folks with us will will be key. Absolutely. Perfect. And I'll let uh, Jessica uh, talk about the sixth and last question. But thanks, Marcel. The, the financing question is, is going to be a very interesting question as, as it really hits many aspects of, of the value chain as well, and where regulation and, um, and banking needs to be integrated to, to really feed the end market, but also um, strengthen the, the entire value chain. On question six here, um, we shift to how can the, the uh, adoption of the hydrogen economy by the trucking sector benefit other mobility sectors or other industries? So what we're looking at here is um, what are the other end uses um, of hydrogen in a hydrogen economy? So previously in my presentation, I talked about that, you know, that it can be used in big industry um, as cement and steel, um, as well as the chemical industry. Um, this is great. Um, we talk about how um, uh, the trucking sector can be an anchor in this transition. But we can also talk about how other mobility sectors can benefit from this as well. So whether that be marine, or rail, or even air, warehouses, etc. So there's there's a lot of activity going on as it relates to hydrogen, and we just want to to understand where there's linkages and and um, shared interests where we can transition together and join join the interests of all all of the various industries. Absolutely, I think that's uh, that's key is to come uh, to together as a joint voice uh, mm -hmm. towards those uh, those investments uh, because uh, government agencies will not probably just listen to one sector, but probably be um, uh, very keen to see what other um, uh, sectors have to say about it. So let's move now to the deliverables of our working session. Uh, to the next slide, please. So we already have two deliverables, pretty simple. Uh, for each one of those uh, focus areas, we would like to identify three main solutions, yes? And uh, in addition, for each one of the fo those focus areas, we would like to identify the three main roadblocks that we need to need to address and uh, keep in uh, mind, yeah? So if we go to the, to the next session, uh, to the next uh, slide, uh, maybe just a quick reminder because it is a call for experts in terms of the, the experts needed. So maybe Marcel, you maybe a quick reminder of some some of the folks that you have to have in mind. No, absolutely. So uh, you know, um, in the first category, we would really benefit from freight carriers in various sectors, be it LTL, truckload, container, tank truck. And from a trucking association perspective, we always we already have the Canadian Trucking Alliance that have signed up.
So it would be great. And, and obviously the MTA is is a is also a member of the of the coalition here. So but it would be great to have uh, other trucking associations. Uh, be it a province, state, or from uh, from other countries, uh, sign up. Um, <clears throat> on the OEM and fuel cell technology provider, uh, you've already mentioned the Daimler Truck and Volvo Group uh, joint venture, which is also supported uh, by Air Liquide. Uh, sorry, which, uh, no, different company, sorry. Um, and well, they've already signed up uh, for, for some of these questions. Uh, we also have Cummins, uh, who recently acquired uh, Hydrogenics with the support of Air Liquide. I know we get that right. Um, they've also signed up and are going to be planning on uh, participating. Uh, from a um, um, energy, you know, Jessica, maybe you from a, a third group, uh, you have some ideas there? Sure. So um, in, the, in the technology side, Marcella, I'll just add that uh, Ballard has already signed up to represent uh, or provide expertise for the fuel cell technology providers, which is, which is great. Um, for the hydrogen supply and infrastructure. So again, we were looking for um, existing hydrogen producers, um, but also those that provide uh, infrastructure solutions. So that'd be pipelines, uh, liquefaction, um, other energy carriers like ammonia, that kind of thing, or other you know new technology options for for transportation distribution, and then for the refueling stations, we need those that are already you know, building uh, hydrogen fueling stations, etc. So in, the, in this category, we have a few experts that have already committed, um, including, a, uh, as Marcel mentioned, Air Liquide. Um, we also have Shell that is joining us and uh, ADCO as well. Great. Thanks, Jessica. You're welcome. So if we look at the government and the policymaker category, so we already have experts from Alberta Transportation as well as from Transport Canada who have signed up. So I would encourage regulators from uh, various countries to uh, to join us. Uh, I'm sure you have some some great insights uh, to share with us. And on the financing side, there are actually several large private equity investment firms that currently hold considerable trucking company assets. Uh, so we would love to hear from you and uh, invite you to participate. And Jessica, um, I'll let you have uh, the last category. So, so, so the last category is, is the catch-all. We're looking for all the other industries um, that um, can benefit or have interest in the hydrogen economy. So we, we don't yet have any experts lined up here, but uh, this is where the call is out. So if you have you know, expertise or have been developing uh, hydrogen-based solutions for uh, marine or air or, or rail, um, we, we, we want to hear from you. And also with the other industries as well. So, so big industries and district heat, building heat, et cetera. Uh, and, Jessica, and Jessica, I forgot to mention that Total is already signed up. So, awesome. Excellent. Great. Great, great participation already. So, it really, why I, what I can imagine is really those corridors between different provinces in, in Canada that could bring the hydrogen supply from, let's say, Quebec to Alberta or vice versa and so on. So, I think. That would be the, the great interaction that you guys can have and have that part of the discussions during the working session. Great, so let's move on to the next slide, please. So that will show uh, a little bit what uh, how the session will be carried out. So like I mentioned, it's going to probably be carried out in, in September when we have all the, the glitches uh, ironed out with respect to the, the participation. Uh, so there will be first uh, brainstorming uh, of about uh, 90 minutes uh, where we end up uh, where we're going to invite, of course, all those interested uh, through the signing up uh, that uh, is, is occurring as we speak, I hope. Right, so in terms of the content, uh, we'll have about 60 minutes of uh, brainstorming by subgroup uh, and finally a 30 minutes of uh, reporting of the findings in the plenary session. So that will be the, the, the brainstorming part. And then on the next slide, please, we will have a round table, uh, preferably on the same day, uh, of about another 60 minutes of a virtual session uh, attended by AMTA and the lead experts by uh, category, uh, where we'll record, of course, the findings and uh, identify the, the next steps. So I hope that's uh, that's clear. And I would like to just uh, remind everybody again to, to um, send your interest through the chat with your email and uh, area of uh, expertise so that we can uh, reach out to you in case you're interested. So I think that brings us to the to the Q&A. So we had uh, we had several questions that uh, came even before the session and I'll start with those. 
Uh, and then uh, there are some additional uh, questions that came through the chat line uh, while we are live here. So let's see here. I'll probably start with um, a pretty technical question, Jessica, for you on the solid oxide uh, fuel cell. So what is the view of uh, SOFCs uh, using natural gas as a fuel? Well, what is your position there? Sure, thanks, Robert. Um, good question. Um, the solid oxide fuel cell um, you know, is, is a good way to convert natural gas into electricity. Um, the challenge, though, in a uh, mobile application is the operating temperature. So if it's operating at around 700 degrees Celsius, that's not really practical um, to put into a truck. So, you know, we have to think of, of the end use um, and if, if it makes sense there. In, in this case, it doesn't, not yet, um, but there are applications where it will make sense. So maybe it is a, a good solution in industry. Okay, excellent. Uh, I have another one, I, and I think it's for you, Marcel. Uh, what is the lower limit of a vehicle, a gross vehicle weight, above which adoption of a fuel cell instead of a battery electric vehicles becomes uh, necessary? And if there is any criteria that drives this limit? Uh, great question. <clears throat> really, I don't think it's a one or the other. Uh, first of all, I believe everything from class five to class eight um, uh, can be electrified from electrification, uh, but and could also be accommodated with hydrogen fuel cells. The big selection criteria between fuel cells versus battery electric is really the operating range of the vehicle as well as the utility required from the vehicle. If you have a vehicle that you're going to use for 10 or 12, you know, within a, a the range of, of the batteries and then you're going to park it overnight uh, where you're going to plug it in to recharge the batteries efficiently without impacting the, uh, the life of the batteries and the total cost of ownership of that vehicle, Battery electric is a great solution. Uh, if you require longer distance, such as Calgary, Edmonton back, um, and you want to do that twice a day, uh, then fuel cells, which can be uh, where the hydrogen tanks could be replenished in about 20 to 25 minutes, become the better uh, better solution for that utility. So I, uh, honestly, everything above class five is in my mind open to uh, uh, to this technology. Absolutely, I, I agree, Marcel, too. I, I think uh, all, the, all the OEMs, in fact, are, are announcing ambitions on uh, fuel cell and, and battery uh, yeah. on, on class eight, for instance, from class five to class eight. I think it's more for a matter of range than anything else and infrastructure. Uh, I have another question for you, um, uh, Jessica. Uh, so knowing that Canada is a producer of natural gas, uh, which is mostly blue hydrogen, uh, what do you think is the is the plan to switch to this type of uh, uh, production, uh, hydrogen uh, production uh, in, in Canada or maybe in, even in Alberta? Um, thanks, Robert. Um, so in, in Alberta um, and in Western Canada, we have a abundance of natural gas at a very low cost. Um, we also have the natural resources, the geological formations to put the, the carbon dioxide back into the ground. Um, we have a lot of holy rocks that are looking to be filled. So um, we, we, as I mentioned, we already do this. Um, it's already proven. Um, we just we just need to do it right. Do it more. Um, so when in in the steam methane reformers or auto thermal reformers, we, we need to be capturing and sequestering the, the hydrogen. Um, we will receive a, somewhere upwards of 80 to 90 percent emission reductions by doing so. Um, longer term, we, we can also utilize our, our renewable electricity resources. In, in Western Canada, we, we can use a lot of wind. Um, the, we are a windy province. Um, and in Eastern Canada, um, a lot of hydro. So there are a lot of regional nuances on the decisions um, to whether to use uh, blue or green hydrogen. And I, in the transition to a zero emission future, uh, both are, are viable and compelling and credible. So we, we just have to look to what our natural resources um, are and, and leverage them. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I see there's quite a bit of uh, diversity in, uh, in the natural resources of Canada that uh, can, be, can be exploited. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So uh, maybe one, one other question for you, Marcel. Um, what would be a more efficient energy configuration for fuel cell e electrical vehicles? Hydrogen filling stations with uh, fuel cell generators to charge battery electric vehicles or vehicle mounted fuel cells? 
Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, a, the advantage of the fuel cells over the battery or the difference in operating conditions of the fuel cells over the battery is that it allows you to replenish your vehicle with energy by refilling the hydrogen tanks in a very short period of time. Um, uh, so again, I think it really depends. Um, I think both are viable, uh, the suggestions from the, the question from the participant, both are viable, uh, but it really depends on the utility and the range that you require for uh, that vehicle. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, a few Mar sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'd just like to add to that question. Um, sorry to interrupt there, Robert. Um, okay. You have to think about why would you be um, using hydrogen to charge a battery? You know, that's adding an extra step into the value chain. So you can see the, the benefit of batteries is it's thermodynamically efficient, right? Um, but if you don't have access to the grid, may, maybe, maybe having the hydrogen generators to charge a battery electric makes sense. Um, but I imagine if, if you have the capability to plug into the grid, it, is, it makes a lot more sense thermodynamic, thermodynamically um, and likely cost-wise as well. Great, uh, great compliment, uh, Jessica. Uh, a few more questions coming live here. Um, we are developing um, uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology to help conserve the environment, uh, but in doing so, are there any unintended consequences due to design or process that we need to anticipate uh, and not harm the environment? Are we are we thinking of additional some some um, some issues that we need to address to, to keep in mind as we develop these technologies? You know what? Um, excellent question. The reason we Azitec was the well, we have a full research component on we're building these two trucks. We're going to be using these two trucks. Um, it it should help us identify if there are downsides uh, that that may be negative to the environment. Uh, at this point right now, uh, not being an expert in that topic, uh, but on vehicles, um, I can't think of any. But again, that's why we're doing a test, to try to identify some. Uh, Jessica, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I would add we have to expect the unexpected, but from an environmental um, standpoint, I think uh, water right now uh, stands out as, as an environmental uh, impact. So we have to be conscientious of, of our um, of the water consumption and, and, and use and disposal, right? So we, we there are, you know, the hydrogen system that has a high demand for water, um, either in steam methane reforming or through electrolysis. So this is something that we have to be conscious of. Um, look at it at, at the small scale, but also look at it as a, um, as a transition to a new energy system. So it's a large scale. What are going to be the implications to our water demands and use? That's a good point, Jessica. The other thing that came to mind, Robert, is uh, our hydrogen fuel cell vehicle will actually have a um, a battery, but it'll be a much smaller battery on it, you know, to allow the truck to move around the yard and give it, you know, five or ten kilometers range without having to activate the fuel cells. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, thinking forward to the impact on uh, maybe the reduce requirements for the heavy metals that are currently used in the battery storage um, uh, solution uh, might be an element to uh, to look at and discuss for someone to look at and discuss for the future. Absolutely, those are those are key points of uh, this this design of the vehicle that is uh, this is key. Uh, a question on commercialization uh, of these uh, these vehicles, uh, Marcel. Uh, do you think or do you have a plan for these uh, commercializations of these trucks? Do you think that uh, we will see them on the market soon? What is your best guess? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the intent of Azatech was to very honestly help uh, motivate the um, OEMs to consider the, uh, the heavier weights in Canada in, in their future plans. Um, I'll leave the different OEMs. In fact, every OEM is currently involved, as you said, in developing technology for both of these. I think that will provide uh, an excellent commercial competition and a uh, wider range of vehicles available to um, uh, for to the truck fleets to actually move the freight. So 
I'm sorry. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I, I would just add to that if it's all right. Um, you know, the technology is there already. Um, it's just held up through commercialization. I think there's going to be a lot of, um, I guess, requirement of the transportation industry to demonstrate and communicate that there is a demand for this technology. Um, then that's when the OEMs will will respond, right? So they are not going to respond if there's not assurance of demand. So this this is where the industries, the transportation industries, need to come together and and communicate that there is there is demand that the industry wants this, um, and this is something that's hoping we're hoping to uh, achieve through the Ace Tech project is, is communicating that demand. Absolutely, and especially if we can make it as diverse as possible, and it's not just the trucking sector that needs it, but also off-road segments or mining Absolutely. sectors or anything like that. That would be that would be great. I would add Absolutely. to it. Perfect. I think we only have about five minutes. Of course, there are additional questions here that came uh, came live, and uh, we will um, uh, uh, we will answer them. Of course, uh, if we have your uh, emails and uh, contact contact information. So because we only have a few minutes left, uh, we will go to uh, we'll try to wrap it up here. So uh, like I said, we will be collecting all the names of the experts that have expressed an interest in the working session and uh, send uh, invitations uh, once we have a secu secured a date uh, in, uh, in September. Uh, and I also want to mention um, uh, the additional uh, communities of interest within the moving on ecosystem. Uh, there is a slide there, right? Thank you. Uh, and of course, you can consult them on the Moving On uh, website as well. Uh, I also want to mention that the session is recorded uh, and it will be available on the website if uh, some of you would like to, uh, to get into the details or have a little bit more information on what was presented uh, today. So with that, before closing our session today, I want to thank our experts, uh, Marcel and Jessica. Thank you both. Uh, our sponsor AMTA and uh, moving on staff and uh, partners and I especially want to thank you our audience uh, for your time and interest uh, and hope to see at least some of you at our working session in uh, September. Have a good day everyone and stay safe out there. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.